Good morning. That's the third that's the third message with these videos, and I'm really hoping by the end of this that they all come to the Lord or come to belief. They're all skeptical, aren't they? And it is indicative of, I think, uh, a lot of young people today in a lot of places that they're really questioning their parents' faith or the faith they grew up in. There are a lot of doubts. That's the premise of the series. There is room for doubt. There's room for doubt. It's like we said on Easter Sunday, after the resurrection of Christ, there were some who doubted. Thomas doubted. There were others that met the Lord at his ascension, and they doubted. So there's room for doubt as long as it makes you dig deeper, as long as it makes you investigate the issue that you're doubting. Now this morning I'm going to ask you to think. I know these messages today, last week, they're a little bit deeper than normal. They're a little bit harder to follow. Maybe today even there's things that you're not really that interested in. You may not be as interested in or you never had an interest in what we're going to talk about today when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the Bible. <clears throat> so, um, but I want you to think. You know, there are people who think, and then there are people who think they think. And then there are people who refuse to think. So as, as believing Christians, I'm going to ask you to think. Now, I know there are a lot of churches where you don't have to think, or the preacher will do all the thinking for you. You know, pastor says, blah, 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 blah. Pastor says, blah, 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 blah. But listen, I can't be there with you. And, and not only that, I'm not always right. I, I need to do some thinking. But you know the incredible thing about today is that uh, you, you have, the person in the pew has access to the same information that the speaker has access to. And not just tomorrow or next week, but immediately. You could get the information right here today while I'm speaking. You could do a Google search about the Bible and, and can we trust the Bible. Now, so today that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the Bible. Last week we talked about the existence of God. Without using the Bible, we said that science, physicists, smart people... Many of them, atheists or agnostics, people who believe in God but believe he doesn't mess with us, doesn't care about us, have, have determined, including one of the smartest thinkers of our age, Albert Einstein, that the universe is expanding, it's moving. They, they mathematically, scientifically, astronomically, in lots of ways, determine that it's moving, which means it had a starting point. If it's, if it's expanding, it, it had to start somewhere. And so you can believe one or two things. The atheist believes that that started from a big bang out of nothing. So they believe the universe became, came out of nothing. We also believe the universe started, we as Christians, as believers, and I realize you may not be a believer today, so... Uh, if you're not, that might, that might not mean that you don't believe in God. You might be a non-believer, but you still believe in God. So you, you need to be faced with the, the truth of, you know, if you believe in God, then what are the consequences of not believing in his son? So those of us who believe in God and believe in his son believe that there's a God behind the Big Bang, which we would call, I called last week the Big Bang-er, is that he also created the earth out of nothing, but the general law of relativity says if something has a beginning, then it has a cause. Something caused it to begin. We believe the cause was God. Don't be afraid of science. Don't be afraid of the age, uh, the millions or billions of years. Don't let that scare you. God was, we believe, the cause. So we've proven that God exists, or at least that's what we believe. R remember this throughout this series. Um, there's... there's in the end, there's still faith. There's still faith. There, um, we're asking you to believe what your mind may tell you. No, I just can't accept that. And I'm saying there's doubt and there's room for doubt. And it's okay to doubt even as a believer. It, we're not going to know everything. Secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Deuteronomy 29, 29. There are things we just will never know. I choose to believe that God was the cause of the Big Bang and that there is a God. And so today we're going to talk about the Bible. Okay, if there's a God, has he revealed himself to us? Has he spoken to us? And of course, many of you, like me, grew up on the Bible. 
Uh, I have a copy of my first Bible. It, it, it's at home. Uh, I don't have it with me. I didn't have it in my office. But this is the, this is the Bible. And I, remember, I didn't remember how thick this thing was. <clears throat> you know, this is a big Bible. I think probably I jacked my car up on this a few times and changed the oil. This is one of those big Bibles. This is not a KJV. It's an NIV. This Bible was given to me by my home church before I went off to Bible college back in uh, the mid-'80s. Uh, when I went off the Bible, they gave me this Thompson Chain Reference New International Version, red letter edition, leather bound Burgundy Bible. Man, and I, I really, as you can tell, it's it's worn. But my favorite Bible of, of every of all is this is this Bible right here. This is the Bible. Once I got to Bible College, now Johnson University in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, this is the Bible I bought in the bookstore down there. It's a New American Standard. And it's hard book, and it's duct tape. You got a duct tape Bible, anybody? You know you're doing good when you duck. You got a duct tape Bible. Okay, this Bible's so cool that parts of it come out. You know, I could like just pack First Corinthians 10 all the way to the end of the Bible with me and leave the rest of it. So, this is my favorite Bible. I studied. This is my like I've studied most of this Bible. I learned Greek and Hebrew uh, with this Bible because the New American Standard I think is was, is most, was most helpful as I was learning that. But you imagine this, this thing we have called the Bible, <clears throat> God's revelation. It was written over a period of, six, of 1,500 years. There are 66 individual books in our Bible that make up one book, the Bible, the Word of God. Forty different authors wrote in this book, we believe, and it is uh, a timeless book. It has had global influence. You think about all the people in the world who have used the Bible for good and for bad. Someone said that Adolf Hitler had the New Testament memorized. I don't know if that's true or not, but he so immersed himself in the New Testament and with his other contorted views of revolution and society and things like that, he believed that he should annihilate the Jewish people because they were Old Testament so, and because they killed Christ. So people have used this book for good and for bad throughout the years, but let's not be mistaken that it has been influential to a large degree. So question we're going to ask today is, can we trust it? Can we trust it? <clears throat> is this, as the young people said there, and by the way, those are the people who are being, uh, uh, you know, uh, immersed or, you know, hit from a lot of different sides in university campuses or circles or at their workplace or from their friends. Even people who grew up in church, you know, are, are, are really going to that side saying, you know, the Bible, like these kids on the video, is just a, a book of fables, stories. It's not really true. So I'm saying, have you based your life on a lie all these years, if you're a Christian, that, that the Bible is true? Have you, have you done that? Now, we don't have time to look at everything. It's just some of these topics are so enormous. There's so much material out there, and that's the good thing about it. Because we can't look at everything. If you want to go deeper in any of these topics, like, for instance, last week, the existence of God, or today... Uh, you know, the Bible, the validity, integrity of the Bible and the biblical manuscripts. Next week, Greg Kokel will speak on four different topics. And then we'll jump into Jesus, you know, the, was he really God? Any of these topics, if, here's the wonderful thing about living in, in the year 2016. 2016 is that you can, you can get all this information. You can study this. So here's, here's my suspicion. Most people who don't believe that there's a God, or that if there is a God, that he cares about us, and don't believe in the Bible, most people don't believe based on their own volition. It's because they've chosen not to believe. It's not because they've researched and they've studied themselves into disbelief. That doesn't happen very often. 
In fact, we saw last week, and we'll, we'll see today, and we've seen many people who have studied in an attempt to dismiss the Bible and to dismiss God and the claims of God. And in the process, they have discovered that there really is a God, and the Bible is true, and they place their faith in Christ. Now, that doesn't happen to everybody, but it has happened to a lot of people. So if you're here and you're a skeptic, or you're, you're, uh, you're doubter to the point of disbelief, I'm going to ask you to pinpoint what it is you're doubting on, pinpoint what it is you're disbelieving on, and study that. Now, I'm not saying you're going to come to the same conclusions that I'm going to come to, but I'm going to say at least give it a fair study. Talk to people about it. Because you can't just dismiss it and say, ah, I just don't believe it, it's not true. That, to me, is, is your volition. It's your choice. You're choosing not to believe it because you, don't, you just don't want to. You just don't want to. You'd have to change your life. So, now, when it comes to the Bible, <clears throat> uh, again, we could talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk, you know, I'm going to try to wrap it up here in the next 15 or 20 minutes. That'll be a challenge for me, but uh, if we can prove that the New Testament is, pro is true, then we get a lot of the Old Testament. We get the Old Testament thrown in. If we, if we can prove the New Testament. And the reason is because Jesus validated the reliability of the Old Testament. So if I can prove to you that the New Testament is true, then, then you almost have to believe the Old Testament is true. Because if you believe in Jesus, the New Testament, he believed in the Old Testament. He said, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, that's the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. The Jewish people have a book they call the Tanakh. Tanakh. It's the Torah, the Netuvim, and the Ketuvim. Those are Hebrew words that mean the law and the writings and the prophets. And it really, when they talk about it, it's the whole Bible. It's the, it's the hope. Now, the Jewish people are big on the first part, the Torah, but it's their whole Bible. So what Jesus is saying here is, look, everything... That's been written down in, in the, what we would call the Old Testament. He wouldn't have called it the Old Testament. But what we would call in, in the book, it's the law, the prophets, and the writings. He says, I, I'm fulfilling them. He said in another place, a little more obscure, he said, Upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed uh, since Abel to Zechariah. In other words, Abel in the Garden of Eden to Zechariah in Second Chronicles 20, which would have been at the, old, the end of the Old Testament you know, the Jewish Bible, he says, I'm verifying everything that happened, every person that was killed, every martyr whose blood was shed, I am saying that's valid. So I know that's a little bit harder for you to understand, but what I'm saying is, is that Jesus believed in Jonah. He believed in the Old Testament. People say, how could a fish swallow a man? He, he lived. Jesus Believed in Jonah. He talked about Jonah. Did you know that? Jesus talked about Jonah. So he believed there was a real Jonah. He, he believed in the story of Jonah. And so if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. You know, Andy Stanley said there, there he said, Andy Stanley said, my science teacher told me <clears throat> that the, the Bible was true. It was just a big myth and there was really no God. He said, but, but he didn't rise from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead, so I think I'd rather believe a guy who rose from the dead than my science teacher. So that's kind of where we are today. Now, there are some challenges that people throw out there. So if you're talking, again, some of you, this may not, you may not care about this. This is more a teaching lesson to help you talk to people about these issues. But there's some challenges. Some people say it was written too late. The New Testament was too late. In other words, it was two, three hundred years later. But I want to tell you that's not true. In fact, the New Testament itself says that we were eyewitnesses. Listen to what John wrote in 1 John, his letter. John was an apostle. He was the beloved apostle. He was the apostle John. He was one of the big three, the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And they went fishing, they did. And so he wrote this gospel, and he wrote these books, and he also wrote the book of Revelation. And listen to what he said in the beginning of 1 John. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have, what? Heard. He said, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have what? Touched. This we proclaim. In other words, I'm not talking about something I didn't see. I'm not talking about something I didn't hear with my own ears and my own eyes, see with my own eyes and touch with my own hands. I'm talking about stuff that I was there. I'm an eyewitness to this. That's what he wrote. 
Now, Luke was another uh, first century historian, doctor. He was not one of the twelve, but he traveled with the Apostle Paul, and I want you to see what he wrote in his gospel, the Gospel of Luke, and he also wrote another book. What was it called? He wrote the book of Acts. There's a two-volume set, Luke and Acts. He wrote to this guy named Theophilus. Theophilus. His mother looked at him and said, when he was born, this is Theophilus. Looking baby I've ever seen. Now, so Luke said this. He said, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. In other words, a lot of people have been writing about this stuff. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So what's he saying there? He's saying, look, I've talked to people who were there. A lot of people are writing this stuff. I've talked to some of the people who were there. Eyewitnesses and servants. And then he goes and says, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. Luke was a doctor, smart guy. I think you know, God had a reason, purpose for him. He said, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. All right? And then he says, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So <clears throat> what, what we're saying here when it comes to this accusation or this challenge that the New Testament, it was too late to really be reliable, we're saying, no, it wasn't. We have proof in the writing itself. This would kind of be like you saying, I, I think I will write a first-hand account of the Civil War. Well, I know some of you are old, but you're not that old. You can't write a first-hand account of the Civil War. But if I said to some of you, I would like for you to write a first-hand account of OIF-3, Operation Iraqi Freedom 3. There are some of us who could say, I was there. Or some of you, if I said, hey, would you write an account of the Vietnam conflict, the Vietnam War? You could say, yeah, I will write my account of that because I was there. I was alive. Craig Blomberg has studied this, and, and he dates the book of Acts I don't know if you've ever noticed in the book of Acts, you're reading the book of Acts and, and, and you know, it's about the Holy Spirit moving in the church and all of a sudden this guy comes on the scene named Saul who becomes Paul and God says, you're going to be my man. And so the rest of the book of Acts is about Paul and he's traveling around, he's preaching the gospel, he's starting churches and he's, he's firing up people and he's getting thrown in jail and he's getting thrown in, uh, you know, uh, lion's dens and all sorts of things are happening. Uh, I don't know about a lion's den there, but he was, you know, he mentioned being thrown to wild beasts uh, a time or two. And, and all of a sudden, the book of Acts, you know, he's defending himself before this king, and, and it just ends. The book ends. <clears throat> Look at the end of the book of Acts. It's like, whoa, what happened here? The story's not finished. What happened to Paul? He's on his way to Rome or Spain, but he's, he's, not, he's not alive. I mean, I mean he's, we don't know that he's alive. What happens to him? Well, we do know that Paul was killed by Nero in about 65. Extra biblical sources tell us this. But that means that the book of Acts is dated around 62 or something. So Blomberg dates it about 62, which means Luke was earlier because he wrote Luke first and then Acts. Mark, Luke used Mark to write his own book So, because he said a lot of people have written and, and, and we can look at the contents of Mark and the contents of Luke. They're about everything in Mark is, is in Luke. So Luke, we've used that. He had it there when he was writing. So here's my point. Scholars say that nearly every single one of the New Testament books were written in the first century within 50 or 60 years of the actual events. It would kind of be like some of you, if I asked you to write down what happened in 1977, how many of you could write about what you were doing in 1977? Yeah, now some of you couldn't because you weren't alive then. But I could. I was 12 years old. And a lot of stuff happened when I was 12. I can tell you about it. I got baptized when I was 12 at church camp, just like some of these kids. This was, church camp is great for helping kids make that initial decision to follow Christ. But also, did you know that Elvis Presley died in 1977? Where were you? Apple released 
its Apple II computer. The first Star Wars movie came out in 1977. Lots of things happened. Jimmy Carter was president. I thought I'd hear a, oh, uh, yeah, or a, uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, that's good. So this, this is the same thing. So the, the latest writing of the New Testament was written about that time frame. So some of you could accurately write about things that happened in 1977, and so could they. So this challenge is really uh, without, a lot of, without a lot of merit. And here's the deal. We have no record of any contemporaries of the New Testament writers challenging factually anything that they had written. You know, we have a lot of manuscripts, but nobody says, oh, no, that didn't happen. In fact, people like Josephus and people who aren't even mentioned in the Bible write about Jesus, or they write about the Christians, and they verify that. Now, I know, uh, uh, again, some of you may not care about this as much, but there's some people who say this. The Bible is full of myths and stories of miracles that can no longer be believed by rational people. In other words, if you believe in the Bible, you're believing in a fairy tale. Come on. I mean, really, a guy got swallowed by a fish, vomited up, and he lived and went on and preached? Let me tell you something. <clears throat> if you could accept last week that there is a God, in the beginning, God, and that he created the universe, why would you have any problem accepting anything else that happened in the Bible? I mean, if we have a God that could breathe out a universe, I mean, just breathe it out. The Bible says the beginning was the Word. He spoke it into existence. If we have a God that could do that and then fine-tune it such that, you know, it doesn't blow apart, he sustains it, and the microscopic elements and everything that happens is... It's just amazing to scientists and people who consider it the, the life itself, you know, and all these things that happen. If we have a God that could cause that, why would anything else give you problems? Any miracle? Besides, if you say that rational people can't believe the Bible, then again, you're, you're going against a lot of smart people in the world who have done a lot of wonderful things, and uh, you're... You're calling them stupid or ignorant or naive. And I just, I just think there are a lot of smarter people than we are, I know than I am, who have looked at this and said, no, I can stake my reputation on this, on this book. So uh, I, think you can, I think you can say, hey, miracles, miracles really happened. Uh, you know, if the God who created nature, he could defy nature. He could defy gravity. He could walk on water. He could do whatever he wanted to do. If you believe there's a God, nothing else should be a problem. So the Bible, the story, is wonderful. Now, some, somebody asked me last service, they said, why then, after the service, why, you know, why aren't there miracles? And I had talked about that. Why aren't, there, why aren't we seeing miracles today? Why aren't we seeing things like that today? Well, some people do believe they see miracles. Some people do believe they've experienced a miracle. I think there's a movie out right now, isn't there? Miracles something well, listen, a lot of the miracles that happen in the biblical time happen f for a reason. They happen to confirm the word of God, to show his specific power, or to reveal who he was. And personally, I don't think that, that God operates as much that way today because, and you can look at the big picture here, because he has already re revealed himself. We have the Bible now. In the day when he was doing miracles, there was no Bible other than the Old Testament. And he was confirming who he was to some of these people. I am that Messiah. So, uh, you know, miracles, I believe, do happen. We still serve a God who can do miracles. But if you're looking for one to say, okay, I'm not going to believe unless I see a miracle, then you, you may not see it. You may not see it, but that doesn't mean there's no God. There's a guy by the name of Sir William Ramsay who was an atheist who was was set out archaeologically, you know, through archaeology to disprove the gospel of Luke. He studied and he, he, he discovered things. And he, at the end of his study, he realized that Luke was absolutely perfectly correct in naming and locating lots of geographical places and naming them and their existence and where they were, Luke, in the first century. So much so, and I can't tell you the whole story, you can research it, that Sir William Ramsay 
gave up his atheism and accepted Christ because he tried to study and dismiss Luke's gospel and Jesus and the whole Christianity thing, and instead he learned and could not disprove it and learned that, that maybe he was wrong and that there was a God. And there are lots of stories like that. Challenge number three, the Bible's full of contradictions. Now, I don't want to spend much time on this, but a lot of people look at the Gospels and say, you know, there's, this guy says there's two angels, and this guy says there's one angel. So who's right? There's a contradiction there. And there's, a, there's places like that in the Gospels and other places where they're telling the same story or the story about the same thing, and there's different accounts of the story. Well, first of all, if there are two angels... I think Common Core Math says there's also one angel. Is that right? If there's two, there's also one. Some of you look confused. If there's two, there's also one. If I told my wife, hey, I saw a guy or a lady in a red sweater. Who was the lady in the red sweater? I saw a lady in a red sweater. And she said, wait a minute. There were five ladies in a red sweater. I said, no, I saw one. She said, no, there were five. Well, there probably were five, but I didn't know the one. Would she be right or I'd be right? Well, she'd be right because she's my wife. <laughs> Smart husbandry right there. But, you know, technically we're both right. We're looking at things from different angles. I believe inspiration of the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that things are going to be exactly the same details. God used different people to tell the same story. And I see, you know, something happens out there, and, you know, I might see this, and, and somebody else might see that. You know, you might look for different details than I look for. And when I tell the story, I, I tell this, and you say, but you forgot this. Oh, yeah, that happened too. I just didn't see that. Or that wasn't as important to me. So a contradiction in the scriptures may not be a contradiction. Again, study it. Eyewitness accounts uh, uh, differ. So, uh, you know, that, that's a challenge. And the last challenge today that some people put up for the Bible is that it's been corrupted. When I was in Iraq in 2003, 2004 rather, I started in 2003, 2004, I met a guy named Muhammad. Muhammad was a good guy. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I got back uh, three or four years later, I wrote a letter for Muhammad. Uh, a, a reference letter, and I, I, I emailed it to him. And uh, uh, about six months ago, I got a call from the FBI. About six months ago, I got a call from the FBI. And they said, we need to talk to you. Now, I was in Iraq in 2004. I wrote this letter in about 2006 or seven or eight. I can't remember. Now, I, do, I did finally find the letter. But it, when the FBI called me just six months ago, it kind of, I'm, I was scared. I'm like, whoa, what's, what did I do here? Uh, sir, we need to talk to you. And this is after something just happened in the world, some big terrorist attack. And I'm like, they're going to tie me to this Belgium attack or something. And I, I wasn't there. And so I, I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I'm sure I'll meet with you. Uh, we have a guy in our church, Jeff Long, who works for the FBI, and he's actually friends with this guy. Uh, I found out later, but this guy didn't give me any details. Anyway, I'm telling this too long of a story, but I talked to the guy, and I did indeed write a reference letter for Muhammad. I didn't remember it, but he showed me a copy of the letter, and he said, did you write this letter? I said, that's my signature. I must have. I wrote it. And I later found it in my computer in an old file. Well, Muhammad is, was trying to escape to another country to find refuge in another country, and the government was trying to verify that he was who he said he was. So they trace this one letter that I wrote, you know, for him to me. I'm not going to jail or anything. But you know what Mohanad and I used to talk about was the Bible. And Mohanad would say, the Bible's corrupt. It's been translated and twisted and all these things done to it. You can't possibly trust it. He said the Gospel of Thomas now is the right gospel. How many of you could turn right now to the Gospel of Thomas? Can you turn there in your Bible? No, because there's no Gospel of Thomas in the Bible. But Muslims believe that our Bible's corrupt, but the Gospel of Thomas was preserved. And in the Gospel of Thomas, it talks about another prophet. And they believe that to be Muhammad. But the Gospel of Thomas was written so late. I mean, it's dated to hundreds, a couple hundred years after Thomas even lived. So it's what we call an apocryphal uh, manuscript. It was written under the impression that I'm Thomas, but 
We know it's not Thomas. I mean, you can study the things that are written in it and how it's written and the Greek that was used and all that stuff. But a lot of people will say this. Your Bible's been corrupted. But let me tell you something. <clears throat> we have a copy of Homer's Iliad. You know Homer? Homer, if you study English. There are 653 manuscripts that have been found of Homer. And they pretty much all agree. And so when you read the copy of the Iliad from Homer, who was an ancient Greek writer, and we didn't even know about this guy until somebody discovered this writing, uh, you're pretty much reading from, we don't have his original stuff, but we've got copies of it, and they're all agreement. And they've been, they've been found over thousands of years now, or hundreds of years, Homer has, and uh, in different places, and they're all in agreement, 653. Other ancient works, like the works of Julius Caesar and other, you know, Plato and Aristotle and these guys that a lot of people say, here's what he wrote, and here's what he wrote, there might be 20 copies of a manuscript, or 15 or 10 or even less. When it comes to the Bible, you know how many manuscripts or partial manuscripts have been found throughout history? Now, we do not have any original copies called autographs. They were probably destroyed by the Roman church. Because their first 300 years of Christianity, there was persecution. They probably destroyed them. But before they did, scribes had copied them and were passing, secretly passing them around to other churches. Do you know how many copies we've found since the second, first and second century? Over 20,000. More than any other book. And you know the amazing thing about finding all these? What you have in your Bible that you carry with you today is a result of all these, and they, they don't change. We're not going to find a manuscript out there that, I mean, we could, I guess, but we haven't, that says, oh, Jesus didn't say, for God so loved the world. He said, for God so loved the America, or for God so, we would, if we knew that, we would know it was written late, right? They agree. In 1947, a young kid was out shepherding his sheep, and he threw a rock, and it went over into this cave, this cave in the Qumran community near the Dead Sea, and he heard the sound of breaking pottery. And he went to investigate, and he discovered one of the biggest archaeological finds of modern history, of all history, and it was the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there are multiple caves from 1947 to 1956 or so. These caves were, surrounding caves were found, and every Oh, now remember, when this community was meeting was before Jesus was born. We call them the Essenes, the Qumran community. You can get books on it. They hid these books in clay pots in these caves during the, the Jewish revolt when they were revolting against the Romans, probably during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. You can read about this in the, in the Maccabean letters of the Apocrypha. If you're a Catholic or a former Catholic, you, you might have those in a former Bible. But here's my point. They found every book of the Old Testament except for Esther, and they found Isaiah in its entirety. And this Isaiah scroll was 1,000 years older than any Isaiah scroll they'd ever found. Thousands of manuscripts, thousands and thousands of them hidden away in these caves. In 1947, and you know the amazing thing? After studying these, now they found a lot of other books that weren't in there and a lot of other stories about Abraham and different things like that. And, but what we have in our Bible, this find didn't change anything. It wasn't any different. That's amazing. That's amazing. What it tells me is that somehow God has been involved in the preservation process of his word to you and to me. John Mays gave me this acronym. He's sitting out there in the audience today. If you want to talk about the Bible, talk about the maps. <clears throat> talk about these four things. Remember that, and you can say, hey, there's tons of manuscripts. Archaeology every day is uncovering something that confirms something in the Bible. Prophecy is amazing how many prophecies were, uh, were made hundreds and hundreds, even thousand years before they were fulfilled in Christ and a lot of outside sources, secular sources, verify that Christians really existed 
that there was a God. It just makes me amazed to think that the word of God is alive. That's what this means. And active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And unless people hear it, they will not get faith. So here's my question. You've got one. You can trust it. I'm telling you you can trust it, but you're going to have to decide that for yourself. But are you reading it? We are the most information-rich society that's ever existed on the planet. But are we reading it? Are we taking it for granted? Are we believing it? Are we living it? So you only believe as much as the, of the Bible as you obey. And I'll leave you with that. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word, your holy word that has been preserved for us. And there may be some out here today, God, who still believe it's just a book of fairy tales and myths. And certainly in our day and age, that's their choice. No one will make us believe. And we live in an age, God, where we can say yes or no. We live in an age where your grace is free. We can take it or we can walk away from it. I pray, God, that we would choose to believe. The consequences are far better than choosing not to believe. I pray, God, that you would help us to be serious about taking this message to those who haven't heard it or who haven't heard it correctly. And I ask you, Lord, to bless us because of it. May your word be a light unto our path and a lamp for our feet. May we hide it in our hearts so that we might not sin against you. God, will you create in us a clean spirit that will work through your word to change us, to mold us, to move us, to inspire us. And though there are still questions that we might have about your word, Old Testament mainly, I pray, God, that you would help us not to miss the greater picture that you not only preserved a line of people, but a, a book that talks about a Savior, your only Son, that we could spend eternity with Him if we believe in Him in this life. And God, that's my prayer for us. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. If you're here today and you've never accepted Christ, I'm just going to invite you to do that. This is our response time. Let His Holy Spirit work through the words you've heard and get into your heart. And perhaps you want to come forward and have prayer or be prayed for. Or maybe you want to give your life to Christ like Mark and Jordan Pauly did last service and follow that up with baptism. You can do that today. Stand up and let's sing this great song as we close it out.